Make sure you subscribe to the Below the Surface podcast by Eclipsium in partnership with CRA. We've had the pleasure of speaking with some amazing guests, including Zeno Koba, Richard Hughes, Vincent Zimmer, and more. We discuss topics related to firmware and supply chain security, uncovering those pesky vulnerabilities that lie, well, below the surface in your environments. You can find all the episodes and subscribe by visiting eclipsium.com forward slash podcast or searching for Below the Surface in your favorite podcast catcher. Welcome back to Application Security Weekly. We just talked to Grant McCracken about bug bounties, vulnerability disclosure, and pen testing, and now we're going to get into the news. I'm your host, Adrian Sanabria, and I'm here with John Kinsella. Hey, John. Good to see you again. Looking forward to uh, diving into a few good stories. Yeah, same here. Um, I think we should uh, we should maybe start with one of yours. Uh, I thought this was a really interesting one. I've been uh, kind of following a lot of the custom LLMs people are training to do more niche specific things. Uh, I think most of what we've seen with uh, generative AI have been very public general use, you know, replacement for Google, you know, general uh, ask us anything uh, chatbots. Uh, but there, there's a lot of uh, a lot of niche stuff going on as well with with large language models. Yeah, and like it's I I, I lightly apologize to our listeners again. It, it does feel a little bit like we've we've been trying to turn um, ASW this year into ASW LLM, um, and it's just it's it's every, an interesting every space. Every podcast, man, it's hitting. I know all of us. it's it's an interesting space. It's I'm trying to balance. I'm trying not to put too much in. But this one seemed interesting, so I'm trying. We're trying to ignore like the general sort of hand wavy, ooh, fix everything with LLM, um, and you know, sort of to to uh, uh, move over to the article from that. One of the things we've also been talking about the last year or two on here is like fix everything with fuzzing, um, and like for a while, I think you know we've had like startups on here they were like doing fuzzing or customized fuzzing or automated fuzzing, and like we all sorts of different fuzzing things, and it's still popular and still out there, and it's great for protocols. But I think for a while we were thinking, oh my God, fuzzing is going to save, not save the world, but fix all our problems. We're realizing that's not the case, right? It's expensive. It's hard to configure, get a lot of noise out of it. Um, so there's all these sort of issues. So pivoting from that over to our friends at Project Zero, um, they've been doing a good amount of stuff this year with LLMs as well. Um, they had a um, previously uh, a model called um, uh, Project Naptime. And that was sort of one of their earlier attempts at sort of using AI agents to, to find some things. So the, there's another arm of, of Google for I'm sure many people have heard of called DeepMind. They're like, they're hardcore machine learning folks. So they decided, um, Project Zero decided to team up with them and come up with a new agent, which they're calling uh, Big Sleep. And that's been running. And they're specifically designing this, or their goal for this agent is to come up with and find vulnerabilities at the fuzzing can't, which I thought was really interesting. Um, but the first vulnerability that, that they have found is now out in everyone's favorite um, database, SQLite. There's a buffer overflow, excuse me, buffer underflow, which is um, exploitable. Um, so patch are only a patch often. And as we were talking about off air, and <laughs> excuse me, Adrian, as we were talking about off air, um, most of the places where SQLite are probably is not getting patched. So this could be sort of interesting. Yeah. yeah. And, and did you say nap time earlier? Yes. Nap time and big sleep. What What, what is the, uh, I'm, I'm missing you know, the connection I, with, with sleepiness. I didn't track it down out of an article. It caught my eye as well. Um, I, I think what they're doing is from the point of view of like a fuzzer, you just like let it work on its thing in the background um, and see sort of what pop, pops up. Okay. <laughs> I just, uh, I, I feel like I'm missing something there. There's, yeah. yeah some, I'll keep some digging into find out more and come with, back and talk about it next week. With the sleepiness. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, 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 uh, it's interesting. I, I mean, that's one of the things we've been talking about a lot with this technology where it, it is somewhat unpredictable and people do have a tendency to say, Oh, it can do this, but it surely it couldn't do that. And, and you just have to try it. You just don't know until you throw some of these workloads at it, until you try some of these things. And, and now, particularly as we're seeing people kind of custom train and and wh whether, whether the customization is, is with fine-tuning, alignment, a rag or something like that, or, mm. or building a custom LLM from scratch, as I've seen a lot of uh, – 
Uh, I remember seeing uh, one that some academics were working on where they were creating an LLM just to reverse binaries back into code that perfectly compiled again into the same binary. Uh, and I think the success rate was something like 23% with that, wow. which is not yeah. bad if you've got something that's fully automated that, that's doing that. Um, but um, that, that seems yeah. like the type of thing that the folks over at um, Ida Pro would be very interested in, right? Help make the right. debugged code better, but right, and, and that's the first attempt, right? You know, so yeah. a lot of this stuff, uh, and we're going to continue seeing this for for years, I think. You know, people just uh, just throwing this technology at things to see what it does a, a good job with, see what it's it's able to do that humans uh, can't do. So yeah. Yeah, we're going to end up seeing some really, you know, just like the you know, uh, when they had it using Go, right? Like it was using strategies that had never occurred to, to humans. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that applies to this kind of work too, finding bugs. You know, that, that's a really great analogy though for AppSec in general. Um, and there's, there's two questions that people always ask, one about security in general, like why would someone want to try and attack me, right? Like it's, it's, and then the second is, as a software developer, I'm writing software that I have this one specific goal that I'm looking to do. But that's where my focus is compared to a malicious user or even just like someone else or like looking at it like the sort of the, the doorknob jangling or shaking and try to figure out can they get in. And it's that same thing as, as you're describing with, with the Go game of like just how do you do it from a different point of view? Yeah, right. And then kind of like a meta trend that I'm seeing is this push towards resilience where maybe you care less about the vulnerabilities in the exploits. Yeah. Uh, and care more about how quickly you can react and recover, right? You know, because yeah. if I can, you know, if I, I've got ephemeral infrastructure uh, and it's highly distributed, you know, and I can, I can just, uh, and I'm secure in my ability to, or confident in my ability to detect an attack going on, and, you know, if I can pull the rug out from under them automatically, you know, and just destroy and replace that infrastructure, yeah. do I really care about the latest zero day exploits and, and stuff like that. You know, if, if I can just replace infrastructure and, and boot them out the moment I see something, something funny going on. So yeah, I'm a huge fan of that idea, right? Or um, yeah. the whole defense in depth space, like, okay, well, you found a SQL injection, but the account that you've got those that you're that you're going to run that SQL I on, it's a read only account. So you've got something, but good luck. Um, there was a startup a few years ago, I don't know if they're still around that they were doing a con container-based infrastructure. And the idea was they'd keep killing the containers like every, I don't know, call it 15, 30 seconds. So yeah. even if you managed to find a, an exploit and get into it, by the time you'd get someone with that exploit, the container was gone, you have to start over. Yeah. Yeah, and I, to some extent, you know, we've got, uh, you know, we're going to end up with fully automated stuff working against fully automated stuff, yeah. right? You know, yeah. at some point it's going to get to a, uh, a place where, uh, human reaction times can't really do the detect respond uh, cycles quickly enough. You know, it, it reminds me of uh, there, there's a sci-fi military novel series I got into where they kind of talk about that. You know, like, like a lot of time was spent on making these space battles seem realistic. And they talk a lot about the scale in space, you know, where you see the battle coming two weeks ahead of time, right? Yeah. You know, because you can see really far, but you can't go really fast. And, uh, and then by the time the battle happens, it all happens in like milliseconds, right? So you have to have computers, you know, cause you're passing like the, the combined speed you're passing, uh, another yeah. ship at it is so fast, uh, you know, that, that computers have to be involved in that ha have to, you know, no, no humans reaction time is, is quick enough to be useful. You so, have to give me the, the title of that off air. Maybe we'll put it into show notes. That sounds like a good read. Yeah, sure. So it's it's uh, Jack Campbell is the pen name that they're published under, and it's uh, the Lost Fleet is the the first one. There's a bunch of add-on series that come after that, but I love it because uh, John G. Hemery, the the guy, he's a retired naval officer, uh, did a career in the Navy, ended up in naval intelligence, and has a whole series of uh, advisors, uh, scientists, physicists, uh, you know, that kind of help him. Like he was very intent on making it feel and seem realistic. Cool. Uh, you know, the, the idea that you have all this boring, boring time, you know, before the battle happens, which uh, uh, I'm sure <clears throat> happens somewhat on oceans, you know, and, and terrestrial type, type attacks, but much more in space since the, the, 
distances are so vast. But yeah, it's um, to some extent we're already seeing that. You know, it was one of my big concerns with AI and LLMs is that they would start fully automating the last few things that ransomware crews were doing uh, by hand, and uh, because the the attacker side does have uh, a talent gap, right, a, a skills gap where. Uh, you know, we've seen in many cases, and this kind of gets into uh, story number eight under mine, you know, talking about info stealers, where they get way more credentials than they ever have time to to exploit and to get into. Uh, yeah, it's so- it's it, it's a talk about a um, there's a phrase out there I'm forgetting now, but just like a wealth of, you know, all this data that you've already you've done the scan, you've got the results and like how just like. If they only had more people, they could make so much more money. <laughs> right. Right. Like the, the Uber case from 2016, you know, that famously resulted in, you know, the, the CISO uh, uh, getting getting tried in court, uh, you know, yeah. for, for paying the, the attackers. In that case, one of the things that came out is they hired somebody to write a script uh, to just go through uh, GitHub and pull out credentials. Uh, and this is long before GitHub was notifying uh, repo owners that they had uh, API keys, AWS keys, and stuff like that in their code. Mm. Uh, so it, it was just low-hanging fruit everywhere. And they ended up with a list of over a 1,000 organizations that they had some level of access into. And they just ran it uh, across the Alexa top uh, 100,000 or or 1 million or something like that. And Uber came out on top. So they went after Uber. That's how they selected Uber from that. They they, they went based on website popularity, uh, sort of uh, based, on, based on the Alexa top 1 million. And uh, so there were 999 other businesses. They did not have time to go and, uh, and, and ransom. So that's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, quick aside for our listeners, if there's any CISOs out there, uh, if you ever get in a situation like um, that Uber CISO was in, uh, reach out to him. Uh, I was at a talk, I think last summer, that was purposely not recorded, um, mm-hmm. where he sort of told his side of the story, which I still don't think has been published because I think there's still legal stuff going on. Right. Um, and he's he's Joe it's very interesting, name, right? By the way. Yeah. If you're in that situation, like you're CISO, and someone decides to make you the fall guy what do you do or what's it like? What's the experience like? There's, you know, talk about run books and stuff like that. There's not exactly a playbook and like how you respond in that case. Um, so definitely either, you know, if, if you're hopefully nobody, but if you're ever in a situation like that, um, reach out to him or what the lawyers have represented him. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very interesting case. Um, yeah. yeah, we, we did a special on that a couple of years ago on, on mine where I brought on a bunch of CISOs and we talked about it, but but you're right. Um, we were talking about it based on incomplete data, you know. So we we still don't know the the full story there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, info stealers. Uh, getting into that uh, for for those who don't know, this is malware that uh, you often get by I- installing cracked versions of software. Uh, you know, sometimes it's uh, they actually pose fake versions of software as real ones. I remember last year people getting infected with info stealers because they wanted to install OBS, uh, the uh, streaming software oh, I remember that. you can use yep. to mm-hmm. put on-screen graphics and, and things like that uh, on top of your video while you're, while you're streaming or recording. Um, <clears throat> and the, the Google uh, ad links, uh, in, in, I'm using the wrong term, but when you do a Google search, uh, back then when you did a Google search for OBS, uh, the sponsored links you would get in your search results were the malicious results that would get you infected with an info stealer. You know, so Google yeah. was actually serving up uh, as a very first link in front of the SEO links uh, malware. And, and the cost uh, per click was what, probably pretty cheap on that too. Yeah. And, and, and what this malware, uh, there's a lot of money in that. And that's, that's what this article is about from 404 Media, which is one of my favorite independent media outlets. Uh, almost everything they publish is gold. Uh, yeah. It's only four people, four journalists, and, and they get so many great exclusives. And they just did a deep deep dive on info stealers here. Uh, and again, for folks who don't know, this is malware that just scoops up all your credentials. Uh, they will grab your logged in session tokens. Uh, so your Slack tokens, uh, your 
anything from your browser that they can get a, a, a hand on. They started off trying to grab your uh, going after Bitcoin, going after people's uh, crypto wallets, uh, the keys to their crypto wallets, the, uh, the wallets themselves, that kind of stuff. And then in doing that, realized they could also scoop up all this other stuff. So we've seen a bunch of breaches that happen because a security engineer or a cloud engineer or a developer gets uh, an info stealer malware on their corporate laptop or on a personal laptop where they're doing work. And those uh, corporate credentials get scooped up by the info stealer and they get sold on the market. And, uh, and and yeah, so so the Electronic Arts case where they got in and they leaked all the GTA 6 code, uh, that came from buying a Slack key for something like 10 bucks or 20 bucks off wow. the Genesis market, uh, which has since been taken down by law enforcement. But it's a huge issue. And, and it's, it's kind of fascinating to me that in 2024, uh, I can take John's Slack key off his machine, put it on my machine and be logged in as him, bypassing MFA and, and all other authentication. Like, uh, you know, I would think we would have come up with a way by now to link those auth keys with the device, right? So that you can't move them to another system. Uh, but in, in a lot of cases, that's all you need to do. And you bypass MFA. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting one, though. You think about it. Um, as I can think of a few mobile apps like banking and things like that, what they will, if they see you log in on a new machine or if you get like a, a new phone or something, it'll go, hey, you need to re-authenticate. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a lot of people think of Slack of like, as like, oh, it's just like for chat. Well, we don't need to be that secure over there. It's just, right. you know, our security policy says don't paste stuff in there that's sensitive. But beside that, oh, it, it's just Slack. It's just for chatting. Where are we going to grab beers on Friday night? Um, and that's not really the case. So. How do you, again, where I'm going is comes back to the dev developer when they're writing this software of like, what's the use case that you're trying to secure or protect against? Mm -hmm. um, and if they decide it's not that, then they're not going to be doing, like you said, of tracking like which machine it came from or, hey, that's an additional t 20 bytes we've got to store in a cloud for all our 10 million users or something like this. And But yeah, it actually is a sort of a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, so there, there have been a bunch of breaches that have been uh, connected with info stealers. Like uh, LastPass, uh, I think uh, one of the one of the several breaches they had was linked to this. Um, what was that? Um, I'm blanking on the name of it, but it's it's like a Ansible Salt uh, uh, Chef type uh, tool Terraform. that had a. What was it? Terraform. No, no, because that's hashing. There's so many right? of them. Yeah, yeah. Let me look at my breach research real quick. But uh, but yeah, a ton of them. Uh, and, and it's it's the same thing every time. It's an engineer's laptop. Uh, you know, they they have uh, you know API keys and stuff on their on their system, and they get in from that. Like like the example with Lapsus with uh, Electronic Arts. Uh, Slack didn't get them into the large organization, uh, but it got them into the Slack where they're able to use social engineering to then uh, get access to accounts and, and get it, you know, step up from there. Um, it amazes me. Like there's um, Circle CI. There's not Circle CI. Oh, Circle CI. Yeah. There was a nonprofit that I was active in for a while. And um, someone would get my, someone would send out phishing attempts. Um, targeted to other members of the org saying it was from me and that like I needed to like that standard when we hear of like, oh, we need to have an emergency meeting. Can you, you know, contact me or do this, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I get these emails from them going, John, John, you're hacked. I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm not hacked. <laughs> That's phishing, right? It's just like pretty simple, right. but it's, it's still um, quite prevalent. And so that, that kind of brings me to uh, you know, the reason that I've got, uh, recall on here, you know, because one of the things those info stealers are doing is even OCRing from images. And I, I don't know, I haven't dived too deep into Windows Recall, but my understanding is that it is taking screenshots. It is taking yeah. actual images of your screen. Uh, and that's how it works. And, mm -hmm. and that is one of the things people are worried about is that the info stealer uh, will get access to those uh, images and there'll be some kind of credentials, some kind of sensitive yeah. data stored on the, you know, maybe your paper key is you're signing up for a service, right? Your backup codes, 
which typically uh, are shown in plain text on the screen of a website uh, for you to save uh, securely and we'll yeah. get attackers into systems. So we had a, um, Microsoft has been going to a, a pretty, a decent amount of trouble to try and um, PR this to a better place. Uh, we had a article a few weeks ago from Dave Weston, who's their, I can't remember if he's CVP or, or VP over Windows security. Um, and they're sort of, they're talking through at, at a, a VP level, hand wavy, like how it's being secure. And so the, the data is being kept in a separate VM on your PC, but that means instead of accessing the data from like just going straight to that, that store on the file system, you just have to figure out how you hack that API between the two systems, right? Um, it, it I, I, I don't know. I, I, I believe they're also thinking about turning it off by default or making it opt in. So they're, they're, they're putting some effort in there, but we were sort of comparing like it's the effort that Microsoft in. is doing on that compared to like what Apple does with this, with some of the things they do. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I hope it goes well because I don't want to see that many people get completely compromised. Uh, but I, I, I think you're pretty spot on if you combine that with the info stealer, what's going to happen here in time. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, they've got to make it opt in. I've got to imagine. So, so John, tell us about um, C plus plus. C plus plus, latest and greatest. On yeah, C++ um, memory safety. So, the listeners have been hearing me talk about this for a while now. So, Mike and I have become very fond of of, of Rust. Um, my teams use it. Uh, I was coding in it for a while. I'm not coding this year. I, I miss it. But um, it's, you know, if you really care about memory safety, we've heard about this from the U.S. government level um, on down, right? Like one of the major problems we have in, in application security is memory safety. And how do you make sure these things we've talked about today, like um, buffer underruns or buffer overflows or all these different types of really common, simple RCEs are what could result in an RCE. How do you sort of just knock off that whole class, right? And that's what the idea of a memory safe uh, programming language right. gives you, and why part of the reason why Rust is becoming um, quite popular. Uh, but C plus plus isn't just going to lay over and, and fall down. So they've been trying to scheme up different ways. How can we how can we sort of do memory safety in 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 our own world? Um, and the reason this is interesting to us is there's so much C plus plus out there, right? It's it's massive amounts in enterprises, so you can't just say change language. Um, so last week, we or two weeks ago, a few weeks ago, we talked about um, something called um, uh, uh, Safe C++. And okay, that sounds cool. And they've come up with a, uh, um, they've come up with a, um, a basically a concept of like, hey, let's uh, take a bunch of things from, honestly, from Rust, like that article or that proposal has Rust mentioned 50 times in it. It's, it's, they're, it's, they're not trying to hide where they're coming from. But so that's their idea is like, how do we take all these concepts which are in Rust and apply those back to C++ so we can make the existing language safer. Great idea, cool. Um, one of the um, authors behind uh, that concept, uh, Sean Baxter, came out last week. So well, before I go there, there's a counter from um, an earlier idea which came out from, I'm going to kill his name because I was too, born uh, Strofstrop, a guy who, uh, one of the co-founders of uh, C++. Um, uh, came out a year or two ago with this concept of profiles and security profiles. So basically, you'd excuse me, safety profiles. So you'd apply those profiles to your C++ and the idea that that would allow you to have guardrails basically so that your code would be um, have higher chances of being successful. So anyways, now, last week, Sean, um, the, uh, the co-author of this, the, the latest proposal, uh, took a direct, direct shot across the bow of a uh, uh, the earlier one with a blog titled "Why Safety Profiles Failed," so it's it's an interesting read of of talking through like you know that's a nice idea, but these are all the things which are wrong with it. Um, you know, some of it is like sometimes you need not just the initial compiler to do this; you need to have some uh, actual checks at runtime. You can't just infer safeness. Um, you have to have like a little more rigid uh, concepts, which is why people are liking Rust and hopefully save C plus plus. So. Um, it's it's not too long. It's got some really great examples in it, like in, in their previous example, or their previous uh, doc, which came out a few weeks ago. So if folks are tr trying to wrap their head around what's going on with the C++ thing. Can we possibly make our, our C++ code more secure? Why should I choose this one over that one? This is an article to go and do a bit of studying on. 
Yeah, and there uh, I, there will probably be C++ on those space warships hundreds yes. of years from now. <laughs> Hopefully no so. Fortran or COBOL. <laughs> uh, who can say? Who can say? Um, <clears throat> not us. We, we won't be around. Probably not. Uh, yeah, so moving on to, uh, you know, kind of in the same vein, the Zero Standing Privileges article here. The, the main reason I put this in here was to rant to it. And in, in general, when I see this kind of stuff uh, where they're like, oh, yeah, security is easy. All you have to do is not give any extra privileges, is, is not uh, allow any network connections to any places that are not absolutely needed. And, you know, it's just not enough time is spent talking about whether or not that's even feasible in a lot of these cases. You know, so and what I hear when I hear these arguments is, oh, all you have to do is add 600% uh, uh, time to this project. And you get, like, these are not simple things. You know, the first time I talked to uh, a company doing micro-segmentation, I was like, wait, you're telling me I'm going to move from eight firewall configs to 8,000? <laughs> every server is yeah. going to have its own uh, host-based firewall that, that's, like, least privilege? Uh, you know, like, like how, how do you, how do you handle that at scale? And they did not have a good answer for me, uh, back at that time. Granted that was 11 years ago, yeah. but, uh, I, I've, <laughs> I'm not sure if they have a, a better answer at it today. So it's, um, <clears throat> I, I love this kind of stuff I irritates do. me because I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing the solution to scale for this, you know, for, for yeah. how you, how you convince people to spend, 400% extra time on their project to do security. Dude, it's simple. It's just machine learning. Just let it take care of it. Um, as I used to really love Maybe. hardening either systems or software. So I've spent a ton of time doing that. Like actually how many of these permissions can I pull out? And like it's, yeah. but yeah, that's security nerd stuff, right? That's, it, it, I would spend probably sometimes days on like either a system or, or, you know, an application. And as you say, the scalability, right? Like, Good luck. Um, yeah, I, I've seen container stuff where, like, like you debug at runtime, and it can tell you, you know, what your unused code yeah. is, right? Like, yeah. like it looks at what what's executed, what's not. These libraries never went from the file system into memory, so mm -hmm. you should be able to remove them, right? You know, so yeah. autom there should be some amount of automation you can do here to reduce uh, attack surface, to reduce uh, privileges and things like that, and, and I think that's. I'm just not seeing that in any of these write-ups. I'm not seeing but that's, people talk about how they're making this feasible. Yeah. And that's, so that's part of what I was doing at Layered Insight was um, taking that debug information off a program in a container, figuring out what is or isn't being used. And then that was my where I wanted to go was to like, remove these libraries. But the problem is, how long are you going to run that training period? Are you going to run it for five minutes, an hour, a day? And what happens if like once a year you need this extra library? And suddenly your program crashes right when it needs it. And that, that's the um, the tricky part of it. Um, you almost need to link it back to or have it somehow connect back to a static analysis of the code and actually see what the code's using and then go off that. But again, who got time for that? Right. Well, somebody had time to buy a Nintendo alarm clock and pull it <laughs> apart. And, uh, you know, on, on the podcast I do, I like to end with something a little fun, you know, a bit of a non sequitur. And uh, I, I love reverse engineering on, on products, and this uh, Nintendo alarm clock was a fun one. I was actually kind of surprised at how much security was in here. The file system was encrypted, uh, so they had to figure out how to get around that. And it's a these are always fun write ups because it's a combination of uh, you know programming. You know they they wrote some code to make uh, you know the do the reverse engineering and to make these attacks possible with the goal being to run your own code on the device, right? To be able yeah. to repurpose it for whatever you want. And uh, so there's some soldering involved. Uh, you know, luckily taking apart the thing uh, was like a single screw and it just came apart. So very unlike most uh, smart devices and, and new products we see sold today, which are often held together by glue. So it was, it was nice yeah. to see it was easy to physically take apart. Uh, but yeah, figuring out the bootloaders and, and how to run code uh, was a much longer process. And uh, I just find these kinds of write-ups uh, delightful. So I love these for all those reasons, but also um, 
I'm a big fan of giving our listeners an example of like, hey, here, you can go buy one of these things and take it apart and like learn how to do this yourself, right? Like I'm tempted to grab one. Like yeah. it's not like I've got time <laughs> right now to do this type of thing, but I think it'd be fun to spend a weekend with this and like some of my tools and just like see how far I can get. Um, so I love these articles from that point of view. I hadn't seen this one, Adrian, but there was another one I saw in the headlines this morning. Um, someone asked a question in the comments down here. Um, but apparently someone else has actually figured out how to do it. They've got doom running on this thing, apparently. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, there you go. Yeah. The first comment for was, was, can it run crisis? Which, uh, yes. you know, some, some people listening won't be old enough to get that joke. You know, the, <laughs> the original crisis maybe came out in the early two thousands, the late nineties. And it was kind of the epitome of the game that you had, had to build a PC, a gaming PC around. So like the first gaming PCs were built to run Crisis is is the joke here, because uh, uh, almost no normal system uh, had the had the specs to run it. It wasn't it wasn't even that great of a game. But uh, you know, come at me in the comments on that. If, How if far we've come. <laughs> but yeah, Doom. Uh, the other thing that runs Doom uh, that we talked about uh, uh, on my podcast last week was the um, uh, the Red Box. Uh, uh, Booths, really? Yeah. So Redbox uh, went into bankruptcy. Oh yeah, yeah, a yeah. Bunch, yeah, a bunch of people uh, going to Walgreens and CVS and saying, "Hey, I can take that off your hands if you want." And they're like, "Sure, go for it." Like nobody's coming to pick it up. It's a piece of garbage as far as we're concerned. Take it away. And and people are, uh, you know, that's if you want the exact opposite uh, in terms of, uh, size, uh, for, for projects and, yeah, and totally. this alarm clock is too cute and small for you. Uh, you can, uh, maybe go pick up one of those from your, your local grocery store. And, uh, is that like the be, 20, is that like the 20, 2024, 2025 version of having an arcade machine at home, have a red box. Exactly. And, and it's those kinds of people that are grabbing these yeah. things. Uh, people are <laughs> writing software for it and, uh, with, with the goal of repurposing it as their home, uh, physical media storage, you know, because yeah. anything that's a DVD, a Blu-ray, uh, a video game that's that size of disc, uh, you can put into this thing, and I think it holds hundreds, easily hundreds wow. of discs. So for most people, that will hold their entire media collection, and they'll be able to, instead of going to search through a bookcase filled of uh, uh, Blu-ray, uh, plastic Blu-ray containers, uh, they'll be able to go up to their red box and ask for a specific title. So Hilarious. very, very cool project. Yeah. All right. And that's, uh, that's all I've got for today. Uh, thanks so much, uh, John, for helping me out with my, uh, my first day here in ASW as the, as, as the main host. I, I think I did Definitely. it once or twice. Loving it. Past, Looking forward to the month. But, but it's, it's been, uh, it's been a long time and yeah, I'm here for the next two weeks. So looking forward to it. Definitely. And, uh, yeah. Remember to subscribe, share in the socials, check out the show notes. And thanks to everybody who watched or listened to this week's episode of Application Security Weekly. And speaking of recall, for a very different vibe from the usual Mike Shima recommendations, check out Glass, Concrete, and Stone by David Byrne. See you next week on Application Security Weekly. <laughs>